Hi everyone, Naveen Nathan, Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology, uh, Assistant Director of Education at Northwestern University. We're going to go through uh, the next uh, installment of our section on renal and urinary systems, electrolyte balance for the ABA Part 2 Advanced Exam. And um, in this lecture, we're really going to focus on uh, anesthetic management of renal failure, particularly from the standpoint of pharmacologic therapy. Uh, we're going to talk about anesthetic and non-anesthetic drugs in renal failure. So a lot of the questions um, that relate to this keyword in the ABA exam have related to this particular topic. So uh, I really want you to focus on a lot of this material. Um, we're going to start with uh, the drug class that gets probably the most attention when managing the patient with renal insufficiency, and that's muscle relaxants. So overall, you should definitely know that long-acting muscle relaxants, uh, particularly pancuronium, should be avoided in renal failure. Uh, this drug really isn't available that much anymore in the U.S. Uh, you won't find yourself using it, so kind of not really an issue, but uh, you know, there are parts of the world where there, it, it is still available. Um, but it is a long-acting, uh, non-depolarizing amino steroid muscle relaxant that is heavily dependent on renal excretion. Uh, for its clearance, so uh, clearly not a wise choice for patients with renal insufficiency. Okay, a portion of this excretion occurs after biotransformation to uh, a very um, less active metabolite. Um, it's a uh, 3-hydroxypancuronium, uh, but definitely avoid this in renal failure. Um, even though it's not technically available, uh, you know, it takes a few years for the ABA to sort of jettison um, some of these uh, outdated drugs from the exam. Uh, you, you know, it, it, it's not like they come off the market and all of a sudden they don't show up on the exam anymore. They recycle a lot of this stuff, so definitely worth knowing. So you have intermediate acting neuromuscular relaxants like atricurium, cisatricurium, vecuronium, and rocuronium. Uh, all of these, with the exception of maybe atricurium, are still in play clinically. Um, atricurium uh, is significant for its enormous amount of histamine release. Uh, which makes it less, of attractive, less attractive as a muscle relaxant. So you don't really see it in use, whereas the other three you definitely do. Um, overall, uh, there might be some amount of increased prolongation of effect with, uh, with rocuronium of these three, uh, to a mild degree of vacuronium, but cisatricurium uh, undergoes ester uh, hydrolysis as well as primarily Hoffman degradation, which is a non-enzymatic uh, degradation. Uh, in the plasma, so it, it really is independent of renal excretion. Um, and so overall, these, these drugs are generally pretty forgiving. Uh, and like I said, there's some mild dependence, around 10% or so of renal dependence for rocuronium. So that, that's, uh, that's a drug that its clearance will be prolonged to some degree. Um, Atricarium, as I said, a lot of histamine release. You don't use it much anymore. Uh, little tidbit, you know, it does uh, form a metabolite called adenosine, which may cause epileptiform activity uh, with repeated dosing or continuous infusion or decreased clearance. So um, I don't know if that's uh, shown up on the exam in uh, the past five years or not. Uh, prior to that, it was still in play, that little sound bite. So uh, again, worth noting. And in this table, what you have is a list of muscle relaxants and their percent dependence on renal excretion. Okay, and you can see vecuronium and rocuronium have about a third of their uh, uh, you know, drug content dependent on renal excretion. Um, and so um, of the two, vecuronium is the one that does have a renally excretive metabolite. Uh, and so you want to avoid uh, either of these drugs uh, if possible. Uh, at least by the books, um, you would want to use an alternative like cisatricurium for patients with uh, renal insufficiency. Uh, that said, um, and you'll see coming up, uh, so long as you titrate these drugs uh, to your effect, um, you should be able to reverse them um, because, as it turns out, your reversal agents are prolonged to the same extent as uh, your muscle relaxants. Um, you know, really, the only one to avoid, uh, absolutely, is, is pancuronium. And these days, with the advent of the u use of uh, Sugamidex, um, you can really, uh, you know, be safe and confident that the use of rocuronium uh, is not going to shoot you in the foot and lead to uh, long-lasting paralysis in the patient who can't clear the drug. So <clears throat> overall, uh, succinylcholine, uh, atricurium and cisatricurium, and mivicurium, which is uh, to some degree making a small uh, comeback, uh, have minimal renal excretion, and that all relates to their modes of um, clearance. Uh, succinylcholine, mivicurium, 
uh, dependent on estrohydrolysis, and to a lesser degree, atricurium and cis-atricurium as well. Uh, but those latter two uh, essentially undergo Hoffman degradation. Succinylcholine um, can be utilized safely in, in renal failure so long as the, uh, the uh, current uh, potassium level is not dangerously elevated because, of course, it's a depolarizer and will transiently increase your potassium uh, by about 0.5 milliquilins. So um, in, some, in some cases, I will hear residents say that, you know, succinylcholine might be safe even in the use of renal failure patients whose K is a little bit uh, uh, higher because these patients are used to high potassium, so, you know, they're adapted to it. That's a completely false statement, okay, understand that. Uh, that does come up on the oral boards as well. Um, you know, potassium is mostly an intracellular ion. It's only a small percent of it that actually exists in the vascular circulation. Okay, and so what happens is, you know, extremely small changes in the K concentration lead to large changes in its clinical effect. It only takes a bump of a little bit of potassium to induce an arrhythmia. Compare that to sodium, for example, which is mostly intravascular. It's about 140 uh, milliequivalents intravascular, and very little of it is intracellular. If you change your sodium concentration by two milliequivalents um, from 140 to 142, the body's really not going to care. Whereas if you change your potassium level from 4 to 6, that may have a profound clinical effect. Okay, the interior of a cell has about 140 of K. That's where most of your potassium is. So, um, you know, it, to say that renal failure patients are adapted to high potassiums uh, and therefore they can tolerate uh, hyperkalemia to even greater degree is not a true statement. In fact, uh, renal failure patients are not chronically adapted to high potassiums. Uh, if they're dialysis dependent, uh, when they go through cyclical dialysis treatments, they go through very high and very low potassium levels chronically. So they're all over the map. They're not always constitutively high. So uh, if you do a continuous infusion of succinylcholine, uh, that can be problematic because it does have a metabolite, succinyl monocholine. It's pretty weak in terms of its muscle relaxant effect, but it is dependent on renal failure, uh, on renal clearance. Um, and therefore, you know, even, even for that reason, it's probably not a great choice for patients who can't clear the drug, okay? Um, and so, in this last statement, acute small increase in potassium following succinylcholine is well tolerated in patients with chronically elevated K levels. Uh, this is where I was uh, uh, talking about how the statement really has to be taken into context. If this is someone who is uh, chronically dialyzed, you can assume that the statement is only partially true. They, these patients uh, may swing it to very high potassium levels and very low potassium levels. So it's not necessarily true that they can tolerate an acute bump in, in potassium. So the degree of succinylcholine-induced hyperkalemia, as you well know, is about 0.5 milliequivalents per liter. Um, and it's no different in patients with uh, renal failure. They have about the same increase. The ED95, the effective dose 95 of succinylcholine, is about 0.3 to 0.4 milligrams per kilo IV. Okay, so we typically dose uh, succinylcholine on the order of one to one and a half milligrams per kilo. And the reason we do that, and we give three times the ED95 to our patients, is we want to hasten the onset of the drug. So if you needed to use succinylcholine and it wasn't necessarily a rapid sequence uh, indication. Um, you know, perhaps you're doing a, a case where they want neuromonitoring, they don't want paralysis. You don't have to give three times ED95 to your patient. You can give them a, a much smaller dose and, you know, your patient won't get anywhere close to as hyperkalemic as a result. Um, on average, what percent of succinylcholine makes it to the colon rejection? Only 10%, and that is why we give one per kilo. It's because a very small, makes, a small amount makes it to the neuromuscular junction. And therefore, um, you know, we want to sort of speed along the onset by giving a, a relative overdose. So about uh, 10 to 15 percent and up to maybe uh, 30 percent, depending on which textbook you read, of uh, rocuronium is renally excreted. Um, the duration of action of uh, rocuronium uh, can be uh, prolonged uh, to a mild degree, uh, maybe 20 to 40 percent roughly. Its ED95 is also 0.3 milligrams per kilo. So the estimated risk of arrhythmias in patients with a potassium level of 5.5 or greater receiving succinylcholine. Believe it or not, uh, the ABA actually asked this question um, years ago. 
Um, you know, I, I don't know that any resident that gradu that's graduating currently from an ANSI program would absolutely know this. Um, you know, it's not like it's uh, one of those things that's always mentioned in the textbooks, but it's around 8%, okay? And this is a study out of Duke, basically, and um, they utilize uh, succinylcholine as a muscle relaxant in patients with potassium greater than 5.5, and they perceive no fatalities or, or arrhythmias, and the overall uh, uh, risk of developing arrhythmia was about 8%. So moving on to opioids, uh, single-dose studies of pharmacokinetics of morphine in renal failure um, overall demonstrate no alteration in its disposition. However, um, it does accumulate uh, an active metabolite. That's morphine 6-glucuronide. That does have analgesic and sedative effects. So that's why it's not a particularly good choice of opiate in patients that can't clear uh, drugs renally. Okay. Um, so protein binding in morphine decreases by about 10%, uh, but overall this does not contribute to an alteration of free morphine uh, since it's relatively unbound. Meparidine, another drug that you potentially want to avoid because it has a metabolite, normaparidine, which can cause seizures if it builds up in patients with renal insufficiency. Hydromorphone uh, produces hydromorphone 3-glucuronide. It's an active metabolite. Um, I'm not sure that it has much in the way of analgesic effects, but it can cause cognitive dysfunction in myoclonus. Um, so that can build up in cases of renal failure. Um, interestingly, there was a MOCA recertification question related to the use of opiates in renal failure. And um, whoever wrote the question put an explanation that hydromorphone is safe. Clearly, they didn't read Miller or uh, Barish's anesthesia because this is exactly taken from there. Um, hydromorphone technically uh, is not uh, a totally benign drug in renal failure. So fentanyl, a very good choice uh, because it has a lack, of, a lack of active metabolites, unchanged free fraction, and short, short redistribution phase. Its kinetics are essentially unchanged. Um, Alfentanyl does have re reduced protein binding, but overall no change in its elimination half-life. It doesn't have any active compounds. Um, overall, because of that reduced protein binding, you want to be cautious with your loading dose, but the infusion dose should be similar to normal patients. We don't typically find ourselves running infusions of alfentanyl. Um, you know, uh, it's not the greatest choice for uh, running an infusion uh, for opiates because it has a very, very poor context-sensitive half-life. Um, so, you know, you'd better be better off running either remifentanyl, of course, or sufentanyl. Um, and with speaking of sufentanyl, uh, free fraction, again, unchanged in renal failure, even despite the changes in protein uh, content in renal failure. Um, its pharmacokinetics are a little bit variable and has been reported to cause prolonged sedative and opiate-related effects. Um, remifentanyl, of course, plasma uh, metabolized by uh, uh, nonspecific esterases and RBC esterases. Um, it does get um, broken down into a very weakly active, uh, weakly uh, active uh, metabolite, which is about 4,000 times less potent, uh, remifentanyl acid, um, and we're not really sure if that really has any real implication uh, if you can't clear it. Uh, overall, remifentanyl is by far the most forgiving opiate when you want to use it in someone who has the incapacity to metabolize drugs or clear them. So inhalational agents are always eliminated uh, via uh, uh, the respiratory system. So we're not really talking about hepatic biotransformation and renal clearance of inhaled agents. But inhaled agents can interact with your CO2 absorbent and form byproducts that uh, may be renotoxic, for example. Um, so fluoride and compound A are the two that we tend to worry about. Okay? Um, desflurane and isoflurane produce minimal fluoride. Uh, Sevoflurane tends to produce fluoride with low flows, and of all the clinically used inhaled agents, it's the one that you would, I guess, worry the most about in terms of its ability to generate fluoride. Um, methoxyfluorine generated a lot more, but of course we don't use that clinically anymore. Uh, fluoride is nephrotoxic. It produces essentially uh, a polyuric form of renal failure. Okay? Um, but again, clinically used in, uh, in, in patients with renal failure, you're not typically running sevoflurane concentrations so high with such low flows for such a long time um, with older, you know, more metabolic absorbents that utilize sodium hydroxide, for example, or barium hydroxide, that you're going to generate enough fluoride to be of any concern. Same goes for compound A, okay? In fact, uh, there were randomized control trials which compared isoflurane and sevoflurane head-to-head -head in patients with renal insufficiency 
with low flow anesthesia and with the use of barrel lime. So they pretty much stack the deck with all the risk factors for developing uh, higher compound A concentrations. Um, but they found no changes about baseline values for creatinine, BUN, creatinine clearance, urine protein, or glucose, or any other index of renal toxicity. And they concluded that it is generally safe to use sevoflurane in patients with renal failure um, without any worry of development of compound A toxicity, which again is nephrotoxic. Um, just be aware that uh, the manufacturers of sevoflurane do still put into their package labeling guidelines that this drug should not be used in patients with renal failure or renal disease. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's the package insert guideline. It's not our society guideline. Move on to intravenous anesthetic agents. Thiopental, uh, classically they ask questions about thiopental all the time in its context of renal failure because um, its free fraction is almost doubled due to impaired protein binding in renal failure. So giving an induction dose is essentially like giving twice the induction dose. It's not available anymore. Um, uh, it's still manufactured in Europe, but um, we can't acquire it from Europe because uh, of their concern that we utilize it for capital punishment. Um, so we don't really have access to thiopental anymore. Um, Atomidate has a high, higher free fraction, but its kinetics aren't really altered in the setting of renal failure and can be used similarly in those patients as, in, uh, as is, uh, can be used in healthy patients. Ketamine, minimal effects. Less than 3% of the drug is excreted unchanged in the urine. Norketamine is a metabolite of ketamine, okay? It has one-third the pharmacologic activity of the parent drug, but it is further metabolized before being excreted by the kidneys, so not so much of an issue. So if they give you drugs that all have metabolites, such as morphine, um, uh, meperidine, ketamine, and hydromorphone, um, it doesn't seem like a great set of uh, choices there in terms of which one is the safest to use in renal failure, but know that norketamine is already further metabolized. Therefore, you can use ketamine in the setting of renal failure without worry of an active metabolite. Uh, now, benzodiazepines are, uh, of all the intravenous anesthetic drugs, the most dependent on renal uh, clearance. Okay, They're extensively protein-bound. Um, chronic kidney disease increases the free fraction of benzodiazepines in the plasma and potentiates their clinical effect. Um, and a host of them also have metabolites. So their free fraction is influenced, their clearance is influenced, and they have active metabolites. So benzos have to be taken, um, you know, uh, exerted with caution in patients with renal failure. So 60 to 80 percent of midazolam is excreted as its al active alpha hydroxy metabolite and does accumulate, particularly during long-term infusions. Um, diazepam and lorazepam um, have active metabolites as well and are also renal dependent. Uh, thankfully, with midazolam, we only utilize very small doses typically in most s clinical situations uh, for which the drug typically just redistributes. But again, you know, you have to make sure that you remember uh, these drugs are heavily dependent on the kidneys. Propofol, again, its kinetics are really unchanged in renal failure. Um, it uh, is very rapidly metabolized by the liver. Um, you know, its extraction ratio is essentially close to one, um, so uh, you really don't have to worry about it too much with renal failure in terms of its clearance. Dexmedetomidine, metabolized in the liver. Uh, it does have, appear to have a longer lasting sedative effect with chronic kidney disease patients. Um, and most, most uh, likely the explanation is that it has less protein binding um, with renal dysfunction. As I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, reversal agents are also dependent on renal elimination and their prolongation of half-life tends to track along to the same degree as the intermediate acting muscle relaxants. So they are actually well matched to uh, the use of um, intermediate acting relaxants like rocuronium. Anticholinergics that you co-administer with these, like, like a pyrrolate, uh, similarly prolong to the same degree. So you don't really have to worry about frame shifting the clearance of any one of these three drugs, either the muscle relaxant, the anticholinesterase, or the anticholinergic. Um, scopolamine as an anticholinergic, uh, you know, I, I would probably caution against its use simply because it does call it altered sensorium and sedation, and if your patient has uremia or encephalopathy, that could potentiate that. And this uh, table, what it's basically showing you is the available um, uh, anticholinesterase drugs, and it shows you the elimination half-life and clearance uh, 
of uh, normal patients uh, when these drugs are used. In anephric patients, in which the, uh, the half-life is uh, considerably increased, um, and in post-renal transplantation, how it returns back to normal for these drugs. So um, you can be confident to, to use these drugs not only in renal failure to match uh, a reversible patient with an intermediate acting muscle relaxant, but as well uh, post-transplant because those patients are, uh, for all intents and purposes, normal in terms of their metabolism and clearance of these drugs. I put this question here because it showed up on an exam in the past. All the following have the potential to artifactually increase serum creatinine except which one? Barbiturates, keto acid, uh, keto acids, um, cephalosporins, volatile anesthetic agents. Um, the, I wouldn't expect people to necessarily know this, but um, you know, volatile anesthetic agents don't artifactually increase creatinine. Um, I think you would have known that if you know, it would have been in the textbooks in that chapter uh, if that was really the case. Um, what I was saying, I wouldn't expect most people to know that these things that do this to the uh, patient's creatinine. Um, you know, it's not the sort of thing that we would ever look up for the exam, but you know, it's curiosity sometimes, the kind of material that shows up on the exam, so that's why I included it here. So moving on to non-anesthetic drugs and renal failure. Which of the following diuretics would be most appropriate for the treatment of a patient with hypercalcemia? Your choices include hydrochlorothiazide, cetazolamide, furosemide, and mannitol. So if your patient is hypercalcemic, you'd want to uh, utilize a drug that um, renders the patient more hypocalcemic, and for that you would use furosemide. Loop diuretics tend to drop your calcium level. So which of the following diuretics, again, similar answer choices, would be appropriate in the treatment of a patient with hyperphosphatemia? Hydrochlorothiazide, acetazolamide, furosemide, and mannitol. So again, the answer choice is a loop diuretic because this also drops your phosphate concentration as well. Uh, it's the best choice for hyperphosphatemia. So, um, you know, it's worth reviewing the diuretic drugs and their side effects. And I know we uh, did uh, present this uh, as part of the part one exam material, but again, it's a little unclear to me where they're most likely to throw these questions. Sometimes just by the way the question's worded, it can sort of flip into one bank or the other for the part one versus the part two exam. Definitely worth knowing. These are clinically useful. Um, uh, this is clinically useful information man, because you do use these drugs, such as mannitol, for example. Uh, it's an inert sugar that essentially acts as an unmeasured osmol and drags water with it. So it transiently expands your, your fluid volume, but then induces an osmotic diuresis once, once it reaches the kidneys. Um, <clears throat> it does release intrarenal prostaglandins, and it's a free radical scavenger. So for those two reasons, it is renoprotective and utilized in renal transplantation cases. So that's the one uh, clinical scenario where it's absolutely indicated. Um, it can result in hyponatremia okay, um, and hypochloremia and uh, can give rise to increases in potassium and hydrogen ion concentration. And that hyponatremia is largely dilutional because it drags that water uh, into circulation transiently. Um, by now you should realize that low-dose dopamine, although it does produce an increase in urine output, there's absolutely zero evidence that improves renal outcome. So although some clinicians still want to use this for uh, cases in which you put the kidneys at risk, such as during aortic cross-clamping, cardiopulmonary bypass, liver transplantation, and so forth, there's simply just no evidence that it improves outcome. That being said, it is easier to manage non-oligaric renal failure compared to oligaric renal failure. Loop diuretics like furosemide uh, actually are renoprotective um, because they tend to block sodium resorption at the uh, part of the nephron that is metabolically most active, and that is the deep medullary uh, um, limb of the uh, loop, the descending loop of Henle and ascending loop of Henle. Um, that's the area where the loop of Henle is trying to concentrate the interstitium. It, it's the most metabolic work that the kidneys are doing in that specific area. And so because loop diuretics work there, um, they're going to reduce the renal oxygen demand um, and therefore be renoprotective. So this can be used uh, in a manner, uh, in such a manner. So about 25% of the filtered sodium is normally resorbed at that loop, 
um, and it, the loop directs cause large salt load to pass to the distal convoluted tubule because they block at that level. Um, so the adverse effects of loop diuretics include hypokalemia, hyponatremia, and if you uh, give such a high dose that you render the patient hypovolemic, then you could result in um, pre-renal azotemia. Thiazide diuretics act in the early part of the distal convoluted tubule to block sodium transport. Um, adverse reactions include electrolyte disturbances and volume depletion. Um, hydrochlorothiazide specifically has been associated with development of pancreatitis jaundice, diarrhea, and aplastic anemia. Then we have diuretics that work at the collecting duct. These are so-called potassium-sparing diuretics. They're essentially aldosterone antagonists, okay? So things like amylaride and triamterene directly inhibit luminal uh, sodium entry, uh, whereas spironolactone is more of a, a putative uh, aldosterone antagonist. They all do essentially the same thing. Uh, aldosterone normally uh, uh, resorbs sodium and kicks out potassium and hydrogen ion. These drugs do the opposite. They inhibit that sodium resorption and they spare potassium and hydrogen ion. So with excessive use of these drugs, you expect the patient to get hyperkalemic and develop an acidosis. Lastly, nasiratide and aniratide, these are type B natriuretic factors, okay? So you can get improved glomerular filtration by dilating afferent capillaries and constricting efferent capillaries. That's how you improve your GFR with the use of these drugs. Um, phenoldepam, again, related to uh, dopamine, it's a D1 specific uh, agonist and inhibits sodium resorption, increases urine output. Again, much like dopamine, hasn't really been shown to improve renal outcome, although it does improve urine output. So hopefully uh, you found that useful as a survey of uh, all the relevant, clinically relevant drugs and their disposition in the patient with renal failure. Thanks.